thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to present my work in front of your audience uh, or my fellow colleagues. Um, I will try to share my screen here. Um, can you please tell me if something's not working? Can you see that? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, perfect. All right. Right, then, uh, oh, let's go back. Um, then let me get, like, get going straight away uh, without losing any time. So today, what I want to talk about is, um, you all know the proverb, like the music, uh, or the tone, it's the tone that makes the music. But if you take it like from a technical perspective, the question is often like, okay, but which tone is it actually? Or what tones are contained in music? And this is the question which I try to have answered by a machine. Uh, and this is basically part of my work with my company, Algorithics. And um, yes, this is what's going to be the topic of uh, today's webinar. All right, so the quick outline, so you know what to expect. Um, obviously, the recognition of notes is related to something that's known in music, it's music transcription. And if you try to do it automatically by machine, it's automatic music transcription. So I just explain a little bit um, the, the, well, the name or and the meaning of, uh, of it briefly for those who are not so musically uh, knowledgeable. Um, then I wanna go into some technical details, not too much, but still give a bit of an understanding how you can approach this uh, uh, problem uh, from a technical perspective. I will talk a bit about um, algorithms that are found under the name of uh, non-negative matrix factorization. I will give some details of the algorithm that I have developed. And uh, in the end, it's the fine, fun part. So <laughs> try, I'm gonna try to give a live demo. So I hope this is gonna be enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, like, um, all right, so automatic music transcription. So what is music transcription? So basically just imagine if you listen to a song with just melody without lyrics, it can be without lyrics. And you would ask someone, and you would like to play it, for instance, somebody else would like to play it, but the person is not knowledgeable enough to actually decipher the notes which are being played, the chords, the harmonies and stuff like that. So you would might uh, refer to a musician and ask like for a note for note copy of like a guitar solo or melodic line that so that somebody notates and writes down this melody for you. And then if you have learned musical notation, you can play after this notation and you can practice and learn the song. And actually there are music publishers who actually do this for, for a living. Uh, so they take guitar recordings, they create their own arrangements for like guitars, bass lines, uh, put them in uh, sheet music and in books, and these books are being sold, right? So starting musicians or like musicians want to practice and play certain melodies can buy these books with the notes and play according to the notes. And usually these uh, books are offered with PVG transcription where you have a piano part, vocal and guitar, and the melody is usually just the melody transcribed notes. The piano part is the accompaniment, so usually harmonies and chords. And uh, for guitar players, they're usually guitar chords written on top of of, of every bar. And sometimes, again, if it's uh, from a popular song, you might also have the lyrics included in there. So basically, as I said, the automatic music transcription is about kind of automating this practice. So here it's not about writing down notes, but actually more deciphering which are the notes and have, it, uh, have them represented in a digital format, uh, which is a bit more flexible and takes the nuances of a real performance into account, not like notes. Uh, what are the challenges uh, for the machines, not for the humans necessarily? Um, so if you try, if you have like a mix of notes and sounds um, and you give it to like machine and uh, you want to, you want it to recognize like the distinct notes with, which are in the mixture, there are uh, certain physical um, phenomena that appear. You have noise, surrounding noise, you might have reverberation. Um, you might have somebody like playing a lot of notes or several people playing at the same time, which is called polyphony. Um, you might have interference, somebody cross-talking, just, you know, your mother came in and she was talking while you were recording something. Um, instruments can be tuned not perfectly um, in a different tuning and stuff like that. Different instruments have different timbres. So to consider all this is not so straightforward. And especially if you go towards real-time interactive applications, which is kind of the topic and the theme of what I'm trying to do. And if you want to combine this or put this like on handheld devices, like on mobile devices, then you have to consider things like power memory consumption. So you cannot like deploy very complex algorithms 
Um, and you have to, if, especially if it's about interaction, so interaction between human and machine, you also have to consider that there is a short latency. So the response time of the machines is very uh, short to what the human is doing. So if you look at all this, you can see maybe that there might be a bit of difficulties uh, with data-driven modeling and deep learning networks. So um, because you need a lot of data actually to cover all the special cases, or you would need to create a lot of like detailed data. The model size is important. How do you deploy the hardware that's necessary to compute all this? So um, a lot of people in in, in, in the world that we live today, we, we, we'll, we'll put this thing in a meat grinder called a deep learning framework, um, put a lot of data in it, and then hope that, you know, if you annotate, have the data correctly annotated by somebody, that the machine will automatically sort of learn how to decipher this notes. This can work to a certain degree, but as I said, for real-time and interactive applications, this might just not be feasible. So the question is, are there other approaches and how can you solve this issue or partially solve this issue in a different way. So this is how I get to the non-negative matrix factorization. So what is it actually? So it's not just one thing. It's just not like one factorization, one particular factorization. It's a group actually of algorithms in multivariate analysis and linear algebra. And here what's important, it's multi, the word multivariate because then it means there are like several independent variables in there. So in our case, several nodes being played at the same time. And as it's just very basic principle for you to understand, you have one matrix V and you try to factorize it into, into two uh, matrices. So that basically the matrix V is a product of W and H. And one particular pro uh, property of this, this is why it's called non-negative, is that all elements of all three matrices are non-negative. This is interesting because this makes these elements easier to inspect. So as you might know, like zero means nothing. And one means, for instance, it's uh, very likely, very probable, so the presence of something. So it can be combined like to detect the presence of certain elements in sound like notes. Um, right, and if you look at images and spectrograms, so which are typical representations when sound and audio, they already are organized in a two-dimensional structures. Like an image is a 2D. Uh, usually uh, data representation, so it's a matrix. So you can work on, on this kind of um, data. And just as a side note, this factorization is not exactly solvable. There are many ways to do it uh, and to approximate the solutions. So basically what we are looking after are these matrices W and H. And just to visualize the problem, so here on the left-hand side, you have the spectrogram. This is what actually it would look like if you play several notes, steady notes, uh, could be a guitar or a piano. So the x x x axis is the time axis, the y axis is the frequency axis, and you see, like over time, there are like steady lines. This is basically when a note is pressed or played and held, and then it's released, and released, and then it disappears. What you also see, you have like parallel lines. This parallel lines means that every note is not just a line, a single sinusoid. A note is a composition of several sinusoids. Uh, physically, it's um, a harmonic resonator, and usually the harmonics, so the uh, lines higher, uh, decay with, with the frequency, so they fall off. And usually the, the dominant frequency is the fundamental frequency, as this is the frequency that we perceive as pitch, like the height of the note that we are, uh, that we're hearing, usually, not always. Um, so what do you try to do here, or the idea here is, so yeah, what, what's a matrix factorization useful for? But you know, if you use your imagination, you can discover interesting things. So if you we try consider this spectrogram as a matrix and we try to factorize it into two matrices as a product of two matrices, then you can interpret this as following, as follows. So the W matrix can be the feature matrix. So it ha can have columns which represent typical features for the nodes that you're looking after. It could be a particular harmonic spectrum. And the H matrix could be just the coefficients um, corresponding um, to these features which are being found in the spectrogram. So as you can see, if you construct your feature ma uh, matrix correctly, and if you do it properly, if you do this factorization, this H matrix will kind of contain the activations of the nodes over time. It will tell you which node and um, where, it, where it is uh, active and with which Velocity. So you will have something like lines as well, but just meaning something is present or something is not present. And this could then looks like, uh, which some of you might know, which is called a piano row. 
which is very typical in like music production, music representation, like a more abstract layer, a different uh, way of representing music instead of using notes, for instance. So this is just the idea behind that you should know. Um, just a few words. This is non a non-convex optimization problem. Um, not everybody will understand what this means, but basically to solve this uh, factorization, you need to set up usually an objective function or a cost function or a score function. And then you try to optimize because you need to find these coefficients and uh, your features eventually. So you need to find like formulate this as an optimization problem that you're trying to solve. And um, you need to define an objective function. An objective function here in 2D can have, looks roughly, can look like this. So it's in reality, it's high dimensional and you can imagine it maybe as a mountain. In 3D, like if you go on top of the mountain, you have peaks and valleys and you walk around the mountain and when you optimize for a minimum, you wanna to go to the valley. And there is maybe one valley, which is the, uh, the lowest. And this is where the very optimum of, of that solution is. But obviously you can see this problem is not so straightforward. There are many local minima, saddle points, flat regions, curvature is, is um, varying. So you cannot solve this problem for normal time if you just, uh, you know, but there are uh, optimization algorithms. Most of them are based on gradient descent and you can find a local mean which kind of approximates this uh, problem, which is usually uh, good enough. So um, this is so much I wanted to just to say for this. And if you put it in a machine learning perspective, so there's one part feature engineering which relates to the matrix uh, W. So you can construct or think of constructing a dictionary, the matrix W, which can, can be called a dictionary for all characteristic node, node patterns in the frequency domain, for instance, could be something else. And then what you would do once you have created such a dictionary, either by learning or you can engineer it yourself if you know what you're doing, you can perform a regression analysis where you try to establish a relation between the spectrogram and your dictionary through the coefficients, right? So you explain your observations with only the elements in your dictionary. And usually to do that, what you would do, you would transform the signal, for instance, here from the time domain to the frequency domain so that you have this time frequency representation that I have shown you before. And you can do the analysis on a frame by frame or a block by block basis over time. And this is how you can achieve to, to get results uh, uh, on the go instead of like processing the entire file. And by minimizing this cost function, as I told you before, you will find a representation of vectors. So this coefficient matrix H that will kind of explain, tell you which node is present to which degree or is likely to be present in the observation, which approximates the observation. So basically this is what you do. Um, if you look at all of this, of course you can just do it purely by machine learning, uh, learn the two matrices, but uh, you will realize you will obtain suboptimal results. So if you can construct, for instance, a dictionary in a smarter way, uh, rather smarter than a machine can do, you can actually obtain better results. So just a comment I would like to uh, make here is that you need domain knowledge and certain signal processing skills, not just you know, data science skills, uh, just to design such a reliable algorithm that actually does what you want it to do. And what we want to do is kind of to mimic the human perception of nodes. Um, Okay, so some details on the algorithm. So how, it, how is the dictionary constructed? So as I told you before, for instance, you can use, so this is on the left-hand side. Again, you see the same spectrogram, it just um, rotated by 90 degrees. So now the x-axis is the frequency axis, the y-axis is the time axis. So now if you look at things in frequency and you just, for one particular uh, time instance, you see again, there are like parallel lines and how can you explain these parallel lines? So usually a tone, a musical tone, a note has a fundamental frequency, as I said, and it has like multiple of harmonics that are based on this um, uh, fundamental frequency, usually at a relate, uh, ratio of uh, integer mul multiple of that frequency. So this is what's plotted on the right-hand side. And each frequency corresponds to uh, a fundamental frequency on a particular node. So one node has a particular node height and a node has a net name. And here is a heptatonic scale. So uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Um, and so what are these lines? As I said, for instance, if you have here a node, an E, E2, 
it's just an E in uh, a low E in a in a certain octet, you will have like a strong energy contribution there. But you will also have contributions at E three, E four, and so forth. So this is like the harmonic um, continuation of a note, a harmonic which makes up the harmonic spectrum. And the dis distance between the two notes between of the same pitch class is is an octet. And this is true for every note. So basically, if you have this physical understanding, you can already like exploit this to design this dictionary. The question is, of course, for different instruments, the strength of the harmonics will vary. And depending on your playing techniques, this might vary as well. So this is something eventually to consider. But you can simplify, actually, this model. You just need an envelope, so basically the set of the strengths of the harmonics that is static, but it just allows you to distinguish between the notes. And for the frequency scale, you can use a musical scale like um, MIDI scale. It's a music instrument digital interface scale, which only considers frequency that corresponds to a particular note. So this is, for instance, what is exploited in, in, uh, in, in, in our proprietary algorithm, for instance. And then having this knowledge, you can construct a dictionary for all possible notes that can be played in an instrument, and you just put the typical spectra as you would expect, for instance, you could put this in a dictionary. And then you try to regress to find the relation between the observation and this sp like specific uh, elements in your dictionary. Just a few words on the time frequency transform. You, some of you might know, but for those who don't know, you usually use a short time for your transform. Um, why is that the case? Uh, it gives you a time frequency uh, representation. It's just because you can implement it, or there are libraries who implement it very fast using the fast Fourier transform. This is why it's kind of very popular. But if you want something more specific, only specific frequencies, for instance, there are other alternatives that can be used. Uh, and you can just compute the energy at only the interested, like frequencies you're interested in. In this way, you can reduce complexity and you can avoid using commercial uh, libraries like the FF. TWW, FFT in the West, it's called, I think. Just aside uh, information. Uh, on the cost function, um, so there are several ways. So basically, what you're trying to do is uh, just taking the time here. So, what you try to do is uh, you try to you observe a spectrum and you try to create a spectrum of your own, which approximates the spectrum. So, you kind of need to measure the distance, like the distance or the difference between the original spectrum and the one you reconstruct. So, you can use something like such a measure, it's called the beta divergence. Uh, it's basically used for distributions, it tells you how similar certain distributions are. And the interesting about this distance measure is that the beta allows you to fine tune the uh, the match. And you can set the beta, which is more closer to perception. So basically, you can force the algorithm actually to detect notes in a more percep perception-like, more human-like way, instead of just doing it uh, mathematically. Um, what else do you do? You can, apart from just measuring how similar the spectrograms are, you can impose certain desired properties on your solution as well. Um, some such properties uh, for instance, uh, are sparseness, orthogonality, or smoothness. So what you can do, for instance, you can, you might want uh, the algorithm just to discard nodes which are not very strong, or perceived not very strong in the reconstruction, and just focus on the more stronger nodes. Uh, you can also try to suppress like nodes which appear in several octaves, as I said before. So you might have like a strong note in E2, a weaker note as well in E3, just because it thinks it's a different note, over, but it might be still the same E2 notes. And you can kind of also force the algorithm to avoid doing this kind of errors. You can also do um, avoid uh, no note interruptions because the envelope of a note is not always steady. And if you want to like smoothen it out, you can also do that. So, um, so in the end, what your cost function, this is the only mathematical, mathematical formula I, uh, I will show you here. So C of X and WH is actually your, your cost function or the objective function that you try to minimize. X is your observation and WH is your reconstruction of X. And you want that the difference between X and the reconstructions is minimal, right? So you have a basic loss function L, which can be, for instance, the beta divergence, and then you have this penalty terms. And each penalty term has a Lagrange multiplier, which is tells you how, how important this thing is. And then the other penalty terms that kind of influence your solution. So basically, if this is all together uh, that's being done in this, I will not go technically more deeper into, uh, into the solution. 
And I think this is a good sign for actually for the demo. So what I want to demo you today, um, we have created a plugin, an audio plugin, an audio workstation plugin. So which operates as a MIDI controller basically. So it's, a, it's like an acoustic interface between you and like an audio workstation or like a virtual instrument. So instead of, for instance, you might know you can play the piano keyboard if it's a MIDI keyboard. You can play like a virtual instrument. You can choose any instrument sound and you can just play it on a piano and it will like sound like this other instrument, but you're playing in front of the piano. So this is called a MIDI controller. But uh, an acoustic MIDI controller, it's not where you push something, it's not mechanical. It's more where the um, acoustic sound, so actually the sound itself is interpreted. So with the algorithm that I've shown you before, you can interpret the notes that you hear in the sound, and then you can convert it to signals in such a plugin so that you can control a virtual instrument, for instance, or you can just trans trans transcribe things. So what it does, it receives the audio, it will recognize the pitch, the different notes, it will consider the coefficients and see if the note is steady, if it's decaying and stuff like that. And then it will send these MIDI events imme immediately, immediately actually to the host, to the host application. Um, so, so far so good. I will change the screen now and I will share a different screen. I hope you can see uh, my new screen now. So this is what's called um, a digital audio workstation. So this is where people make music, for instance, like producers or, you know, uh, you can make music here. There are a lot of tools. This particular version is called FL Studio. Um, I have already uh, taken a sound uh, from the internet and I have, um, maybe actually I can play it too. So let me just load the file. Um, so if I click on it, you should hear it. Let me see. So I think you got the idea. So what you can do with that, um, you can transcribe it. You can go on algorithmics.com and our web server, and you can use the algorithm just to transcribe it. And what you get out of it is something like this. So you get, a, as you've seen before, so parallel lines, it's not parallel lines anymore, but it's note that's being detected at the time and over time. So this is the uh, musical representation. It's basically, this is what it's called the piano roll. So here, you can play any notes and this shows you basically which note is being played at what time. And when you play back, you should hear and recognize the original melody. Of course, it has a different sound now because of it. it's a synthesizer sound. So it's this sound now. Um, and if you play it back, it will sound, sound like this. I think you get the idea. So the interesting thing, of course, of, about this uh, um, representation is, is that each node is now uh, separately accessible. So what you can do, you can shift nodes around, you can prolong them, you, you can shorten them, you can remove them if you don't like them. For instance, here he was playing some chords, so several notes are being triggered at the same time. If you want, want something more cleaner, you can just clean it up or just remove certain notes which he might, you know, just uh, have played by error or not very cleanly, for instance. Okay, so this is the first thing I wanted to do, but um, to show you that what this is actually good for. Uh, and of course, you can compose your own songs on top of that and stuff like that. So, um, but what I wanted to show you is actually the plugin. So what does the plugin do? So here is the plugin. Um, so in the plugin, you can select the instrument that you want, like which instrument you wanted to control. In this case, uh, I, I have selected male voice, so it's me. You have some parameters adjusted here, and I will take my microphone here now. So you see, if uh, as I speak to, into the microphone, you have a level here, so it checks it's kind of working. I have chosen a preset for voice. So basically saying what is working for 
many notes should also work for like voice where you're just saying one note at a time. Uh, and I'm just gonna demonstrate that. So uh, for everybody who is like uh, sensitive, uh, I would ask you to be brave at this point. Um, all right, so I'm not the greatest singer, by the way, especially not when I'm not hearing myself and stuff like that. I just want to demonstrate to you how this plugin works and how this technology then can be used for creative means um, to create music and make music. So um, I have selected this sound. Yeah, <laughs> might be a bit uh, particular. And now if I do a listen, then the, sorry, the machine, the algorithm starts listening to what I'm doing into the microphone and it starts interpreting the notes and sending the MIDI events uh, back to, to the host, as you will see. So, so now if I look at the piano, uh, yeah. So you see, I kind of more or less, uh, a human has more or less two and a half or whatever um, octave of range. So I can, with my voice, actually control, control, play the notes. And um, yeah, I can do like weird stuff with it. Um, if you can hold a note, for instance, uh, oh, I can just listen. Uh, So you can actually do some maybe vocal training to become better than me. Uh, but what you can do, for instance, you can combine, you can play back the background and try to sing on top of that. Or like sing, just make some melodies or whatever on top of that. So I will just go crazy on this and I will just do whatever. Uh, so please bear with me. Um, so I will just record this or I just will start playing and then I can record actually what I'm doing here. And then you will see all my notes I can actually go down with the delay to have like faster responding. So let's just go. Let's go this thing. No, I, think I could try to sing. La, 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 la. But this this one does. Sorry, it's quite annoying. Uh, so as you can see, of course, there's a little bit of, uh, of dirt notes. It depends on your mic microphone setup and stuff like that. Right now you have the Zoom things go going on, which do some uh, processing, but okay, if you removed some of that and anyways. So you could also, also like then just play back what you just did. This is totally crap what I did, but um, you can still listen to it. So now you have recorded yourself. So if you have some ideas on top of other ideas and you sing better, you can just use this as well. Okay, this note was on pitch. Um, and quickly before we run out of time, I just wanted to show you one more interesting maybe feature that's built in here. So here, if you know, for instance, the scale of the song uh, on top of which you play, let's assume it's a, it's a G major. It's in G major. So the algorithm will try as well to map notes only that you sing, only of the notes which are supported, uh, which are in this key. So let's see how that goes. La, 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 la. Just quickly, so you see right now, as before the curves were um, continuously changing, going up and down. Now you see if jumps happen, these notes are associated with some notes on the actual, on the actual scale. So if, if you would play it now, it would still sound horrible, but it will not uh, sound out of key. Um, I 
I think time-wise, I have to stop here. So thank you very much for bearing with me. So just uh, going back to the uh, presentation, just on the one last slide, just what I wanted to mention that uh, this is still work like uh, being developed and things are going on. So if you are interested in this kind of things, you may feel strong about uh, these things, you know, just reach out to me. Um, you know, let's have a chat. So uh, Mia, uh, I think I'll stop here and we have still like some, 10 minutes time or something for questions. So let's do that.